Hey, good morning once again. My wife just came down and she said, I just got so flustered after that announcement that I forgot to tell everybody, let's pray over our offering. And so anyway, hey, thanks for giving. Um, uh, this makes a really good segue uh, into what we're going to talk about as we jump in this morning. Uh, last week I shared how we have just this unreal um, amount of students that have already connected here at Trace, and it's way ahead of, of where we thought we'd be at this stage in the game. Uh, but we're really focused on making this a priority in this season for us as a church. You know that sometimes you have plans, this is what the Bible says, that you make plans, but God is the one who actually controls what happens, right? So we had made all kinds of plans, and then God said, I'm going to grab the greatest students in this community, and I'm going to put them right in your seats. And so now you have this question of what are you going to do when God starts changing your plans? Well, we want to adjust, and we just want to say, this has got to be a priority for us as a church. And so we talked last week about our plan to pull the trigger on pursuing our own youth pastor, which is crazy, just eight months into this church plan. It's absolutely nuts. Um, and while we are, um, like, wh while this is something we're super excited about, we wanted to make sure that we took time to make a wise decision. Last week, we talked about letting your emotions lead your decisions and how it's not wise to do that. How many of you guys were here for that? Do you remember it? If you weren't, you need to listen to the message. Um, don't let your emotions lead your decisions. But we took a really good chunk of time, and we just said, God, we're excited about this, like really excited about this, but we want to make sure this is your plan for us. And so we took some time. We did some prayer and some fasting, and a lot of you guys participated with that. Thank you, by the way. Uh, for helping out in that, in that area. Um, and then we, we started just going after counsel. The Bible says that there is wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And so we asked person after person after person after person who could speak into this decision. And they said, now's the time. Like, now's the time to do it. When God opens up that door, you want to make sure that you greet what, what God is sending with your very best. And so we said, we want to pull the trigger on this. I want to keep this in front of us for the next couple of weeks because it's such a big deal to us. And here's why. Um, we're, doing, we're doing okay financially as a church, especially for only being eight months old. But we need a boost just to get this thing started. And this is what is uh, another one of the testimonies of how God uh, has been so good to us is that once we get this thing kicked off, our budget is at a place already I know I keep saying this, only eight months old, our budget is already at a place where we can sustain this. We just need a boost to get there. And so we've been extremely thrilled about that. Like, it's an it's a amazing thing for us. Um, and so our, our board and our staff kind of got together and just crunched the numbers. What's it going to take to kick this off? And so we came to this number of $50,000 to launch it, to take care of the, the people, the places, the, the process, everything to just launch an amazing student ministry, and we want that. We want our very best, because if you haven't noticed, these are our kids. These are our kids, okay? Um, we've, I've got two teenagers. Um, it's a really big deal for me. I want somebody who's really going to be focused on shaping their life besides mom and dad. This is my priority. It's my responsibility. We're not taking the responsibility off of parents. We're saying we want somebody who's just committed to really shaping um, these students. These are our students. And so my wife and I said, we're going to commit the first $5,000. This is a big deal to us. It's a really big deal to us. And so I want to invite you to join us at whatever dollar amount that may be, that you would take some time over the next couple of weeks and just pray about what you could do to help us just get this thing jump-started. Does that make sense? It's where we're at. It's what we believe God has for us. It's the first time that we've stood in front of you guys and said, like, could you help us? financially. We just need a boost to get there. So thank you for all of your faithfulness, all of your generosity in giving to the church. Because of you, we're, we're at a place where we can do this. And so um, October 27th, it's the last Sunday of this month. It's going to be the very end of this series of Renovate. And we're going to take some time on October 27th to recap and to celebrate. And it's going to be an amazing uh, morning to be able to look back at what God's done. But on that day, we would love to know by then, by October 27th, what you might be able to contribute just to help us get there. Does that sound good to you guys? All right, can I ask one more time? Does that sound good to you guys? Like, do we want this for our students? All right. I would rather have a really good applause or none at all. Can you guys do something really good? There we go. <laughs> 
You know how those, those real, like, faint claps, you know, you know what those are like. Okay. Hey, um, we're, we're in week five right now of this Renovate series, and we've been looking at lining up some really key areas of our lives with God's purposes. And so, so far, we've looked at our spiritual health, we've looked at our physical health, uh, we looked at mental health. Last week, we looked at emotional health. And all of those, if you missed any of those um, messages, any of those teachings, I want to encourage you to get online. You can check those out, and you can get caught up on all of those. But this week, we're going to take some time, and we're going to focus on relational health. We're going to talk about relationships, because everything else in life can be good, but if our relationships are bad, life can be miserable. How many of you guys know that to be true? Everything else in life can be good, but if our relationships are bad, life can be miserable. And there are a lot of things in life that hurt our relationships. Pride, that's his name in, it's true, misunderstandings, who put the empty milk container back in the fridge, all kinds of petty things. In fact, here's one of the, the number one causes of, of controversy. Right? Is it A or is it B? Who are, who are the A people, right? All right, okay, listen. Uh, you, you could have just an entire series committed to this kind of relational conflict, right? In our house, I'm just grateful that the thing gets on the roll. I'm just, right? Um, because of our kids. Because of our kids, right? Um, maybe in small groups this week, you guys could tackle that, and that would be a lot of fun. But today, we're going to look at something that's inside of us that plays a mammoth role in the health of our relationships. And more specifically, we're going to look at our own fears that often ruin our relationships. And in order to do that, we're going to go back to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and we're going to look at the very first couple because surprise, surprise, that's where all of our relational issues started. The first opportunity that we had to do it right, we made some mistakes. And so I want to set the scene for us here. God had just created the entire universe. He had placed Adam right in the Garden of Eden. This is this perfect paradise. And Adam had everything that he could possibly want, except that he was lonely. And so God created woman. He, he created Eve. And for a season, for a time, everything went along really great for a while in their relationship because there was no sin in the world. But then, many of you may know the story, the Bible tells us that Satan comes to Eve, and he lies to her. He lies, and he asks her, he said, didn't God say that you could not eat from any of the trees in the garden? And of course, that was a lie. God had said, there's only one tree in the center of the garden. I want you to stay away from that tree. Everything else is yours. It's for you. And God did that because he wanted to give you a decision. He wanted to give you a choice. He wanted you to choose him from the very beginning. Listen to this. From the very beginning... God actually wanted to give you a choice, and he wanted you to choose him, not be obligated. And so God gave them a choice, and so Eve responds to Satan, and she says, it's just that we cannot eat from the tree in the center of the garden, or we will die. And Satan responds to her, and he said, God's lying to you. God is lying to you. You're not going to die if you eat this fruit. In fact, the truth is, the reality is, if you eat this fruit, you're going to be just like God. And Eve fell for that line. And so I want to read for you the story as it picks up here in Genesis chapter 3. And I just want you to listen to this. It's only going to take a minute here. I want to read the story for you. And then we're going to pull out some things. Genesis chapter 3, it starts with verse 6. It says this, So Eve took some of the fruit, and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. This is where shame enters the world for the very first time. There's never been shame. There's never been guilt prior to this. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Then they heard the Lord walking in the garden, 
during the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. God called to Adam and said, where are you? Adam answered, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. I want you to notice this is the first time fear enters the world. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Then God asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the fruit tree which I commanded you not to eat? Adam said, you gave me this woman to me. You gave this woman to me. She gave me fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Then God said to Eve, why did you do this? And Eve replied, the serpent tricked me, and I ate it. So God said to Eve, I want you to hear, this is the context here. Because, because you didn't do what I asked you to do, things are going to be, things are broken now. Things are going to be more difficult. So here's what he said. You're going to have greater trouble in pregnancy now, great pain in childbirth. And though you'll greatly desire your husband, he's going to lord it over you. There, there's, there's going to be conflict here. There's going to be a power struggle in your relationship from now on. So then God said to Adam, because you also obeyed me and you sinned with your wife, the ground that you work is now cursed. And though you'll get to eat what you planted, your fields will have weeds and thorns and thistles. So you can thank Adam for all the weeds in the world. And for the rest of your life, you'll have to sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourselves are returned to the dirt that I used to create you. Now, Genesis chapter 3. This is a fascinating and a frustrating story. It's filled with all kinds of truths that you could pull out, that you could apply to your life. But today, I just want to point out some relational truths. Because in this story, there are three fundamental fears that pop up in our relationships. And you can use what we're going to talk about today in your marriage. You can use it in your friendships. You can use it at work. You can use it in all of your relationships. Because of these three fears that entered the world when sin happened, these fears work to damage and destroy relationships. It was their original intent, and it still happens today. So I want to get right into this. Here's the very first fear. It's the fear of exposure. And the fear of exposure makes me distant. Now, here's, here's the truth. There are things about you that you don't like. And you don't want anybody to know about them. You don't want to be exposed. You don't want people to see those things. There's things about you that you don't accept, and you're worried that other people aren't going to accept them either. Because when people get close to you, you know this, when people get close to you, they can see you. They can see your scars. They can see your warts. They can see your insecurities. The closer that people get to you, the more they see your blemishes, the more they see your weaknesses. And so this fear keeps people at a distance because we don't want to be exposed. There's this fear that people are going to discover all the unpleasant things that we don't like about ourselves. Here's what Genesis chapter 3 said. We just read this. God called to Adam and he said, where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And I want you to notice these two phrases here. I was afraid, and I hid, because they actually go together. Fear always causes us to hide. Adam said, I was naked. Now, here's the deal. He was more than physically naked at this point. He was exposed. His sin was found out. He was busted. He was exposed. And his mistake was uncovered. Now, it'd be easy for me to, to say, like, hey, by a show of hands, how many of you guys have ever made a mistake? But there's a few of us who wouldn't raise our hand. And so um, we want to make sure everybody's on the same page, right? That's funny. That's a good joke. Come on. Laugh with me. Come on. When we are afraid of being open, when we're afraid of letting people see us as we really are, we, we try to hide. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we hide by avoidance. Sometimes we hide by silence. 
But we try to hide. We try to hide our flaws. We try to hide our imperfections. And we try to keep them away from people. Because one of our deepest needs in life is to be loved. But one of our deepest fears is to be seen as we really are. And so this fear of exposure causes me to be distant. And there's a second fear that we see in the story. It's the fear of disapproval. And here's the deal with disapproval. The fear of disapproval makes me defensive. So we move from simply hiding and covering up to now being defensive. And it's in this moment that all of the finger pointing begins as well. See, if, if a, a person is critical, you know that they have this fear of disapproval. Let, let me say it in a different way. The more critical a person is, the more they attack others, the more they put others down, the more you know that this person fears disapproval in their own life. And so you'll hear it. You'll hear it from athletes. You'll hear it from politicians. You'll hear it from news commentators. You'll even hear it from preachers pointing out the mistakes or the failures or the weaknesses of everybody else because they are afraid of being disapproved of themselves. I, I worked with a person who was relentless in criticizing everyone around them. And so you could see all over their face, this, all over them, this fear of disapproval in their own life. And, and the sad part of it was, was this fear of disapproval prevented them from developing healthy relationships. And so we got to be able to address this. We see it in verse 12. Verse 12 in this story we read, God asked, did you eat what I told you not to eat? There's, here's the disapproval right here. Adam answered, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit so i ate it now i want you i want you to notice here adam took it like a man he blamed his wife right <laughs> and actually here's the reality of it let's dig a little bit deeper he's actually not blaming his wife who's he blaming he's blaming god you made this woman you gave her to me and now she caused me to sin now here's the deal See if this, ever, if this ever applies in your life. Blame shifting. Here we go. According to Adam, he's the only innocent one in this whole story. <laughs> he's the only innocent one in this whole thing. So then, then God moves on to Eve, and he starts talking to Eve. And ladies, it's not a whole lot better with Eve. Eve's not willing to accept the responsibility either. Here's what Eve said. The serpent tricked me, and I ate it. Now, is, is all this true? Yes, but at some point, we've got to own up, don't we? So we've got Adam blaming God and his wife. We've got Eve blaming the serpent, and they just start pointing fingers everywhere because my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. and It causes me to shift the blame. It happens in our relationships. It happens in our, our marriages. Um, if somebody says something to you that you feel has just a hint of disapproval, you immediately get defensive. And you either try to justify it, you either attack back, or you try to shift the blame and you try to accuse somebody else. Because again, this fear of disapproval makes me defensive. Here's the third fear that we see in this story. It's the fear of losing control, and the fear of losing control makes me demanding. The fear of losing control makes me demanding. The result of Adam and Eve's sin here in this story is that they lost control. They lost control of their future. They lost control of their destiny. They got kicked out of paradise, and they are now feeling out of control because they were. And it's in these situations, when we have this fear of losing control, that we start becoming demanding. You could say it this way. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. The more insecure you are about your situation, the greater you have a need to, to grip things and to start making uh, things happen, to control things, to make demands. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. If you're a very secure person, you don't need to have your way all the time. It doesn't bother you. Let, let, me, let me give you just like a super moment of transparency. Um, I like, I like to be in control. I like to be in control of my circumstances. 
I like to be in control of the situations around me. I, I like to be in control. But the more I try to grab control, the more controlling I become. This is a cycle that we get stuck in, right? And so when you can't have control, you start to feel insecure. It's just this, this cycle here. The more insecure you become, the more controlling you become. And it just starts to drag you downward. So if you're insecure and you push for your way all the time, you fight for your way, and you try to take control, the reality is the more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. This is verse 16 of the story we read. Here's what God is saying here, okay? You'll greatly desire your husband. In other words, you both made mistakes here. But you are still going to love your husband, but, this is, this is where all of our relational conflict began right here, he will lord it over you. Some versions say he'll dominate you, some say he will rule over you. And this is where the battle in relationships began. All the misunderstandings between men between women, between spouses and boyfriends and girlfriends, all of the confusion, all of the conflict, all of the jockeying for power and for position, who's going to be in control, it all goes back to this situation right here. When sin entered the world, relational conflict came with it. And so now we've got this issue where instead of cooperating with one another, we're competing with one another. You ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand. Please don't. That would be awkward probably right now. Where instead of cooperating with one another, we're competing with one another. It happens in our marriages all the time. It happens in our closest friendships. It happens at work all the time. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you, if you could choose, wouldn't you move from competition in relationships to cooperation in all of your relationships? That's the way that God intended it. So here we are. Here we are. This is, this is where we make our shift, okay? How do you do that? How do you renovate your relationships so that you can drive out all of those fears, those three fears we talked about? What can we do to eliminate the fears? There's only one antidote to this whole thing, and here it is. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out fear. You want to get rid of fear in your relationships? Here's your answer. The opposite of fear is love. And so when you invite God's powerful love into the front door of your heart, fear runs out the back door because they cannot live in the same house. Fear and love cannot coexist. So you want to get rid of fear, you need to invite the love of God in a powerful way to take up residency in your life. Fear is overcome by love. That's why, think about this, when a building is on fire, fear causes us to say, I'm staying away from that. If you're a parent and your child is inside of that building, love overcomes your fear and you'll run in there because love is more powerful than fear like this is something that you've got to take home with you you've got to remember this for us to always take this with us love is greater than fear it's always greater than fear so how do i learn to live in god's love this is our question, right? How do, I, how do I learn to live in God's love so that it eliminates those three fears that we know are true, that we've experienced in our own lives, because these fears are going to attack your relationships. That was their purpose. Remember, they came into the world at the same time sin did. And these fears, this whole goal of these fears was to destroy relationships. So how do you get rid of those fears so that your relationships can thrive, so that they can, so that they can be healthy? So we gotta get rid of this. There's three things that the Bible tells us that will renovate these relationships that are going to eliminate these fears that try to sabotage us. Here's the very first one. As simple as some of these sound, you just got to follow me so that we can break these down. Number one, surrender my heart to God. Every moment, every morning when we wake up, 
that we would start our day by saying, God, I surrender my thoughts, I surrender my emotions to you, I want you to fill me with your strong love. And here's why this is important. It's really a proximity issue. The closer you get to God, the more love is going to fill, fill your heart. The further away you get from God, the more fear is going to fill your heart. The closer you get to God, the more love is going to fill your heart. The further away you get from God, the more fear is going to fill your heart. Here's what the Hebrew scriptures said. Surrender your heart. Got to pay attention to this verse. Take a picture of it if you got your phone. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Then, and notice the benefits here, then you won't be ashamed. Shame is going to be eliminated. You will be confident and fearless. No more fear. You will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of all worry. Now listen, guys, this is a fantastic verse. Come on. If this is the one thing you take away today, let it be this. Take a picture of it. Get it somewhere. In fact, this week, you may want to write this down somewhere, post it on a mirror, put it on your visor, put it somewhere where you can read it over and over and over again. Shame and fear are banished. They're gone. Instead, you're filled with confidence. You're filled with hope. You're filled with security. And what's the answer to it? If you'll do what? Surrender your heart to God. (laughs) And you get rid of those fears. Like, this is the kind of life we want. You may not have been able to put words to it before, but I promise you, this is the life you want deeper and more meaningful than anything else. Like, this is bottom line, good stuff. That's why it's in the Bible. Come on, take it. Read the Bible. Come on. Live it out. Uh, Okay, this is the life we want more than anything. This is good stuff. I need to move on, though, okay? Second thing I do, every day I remember that God loves me. Now, we sang about this. We sang about this probably 15 minutes ago. If you don't feel loved by God, you're going to have a hard time being loving in your relationships. So I have to remind myself every single day about what God thinks about me. Not what others think about me. Not even what I think about myself. But what does God think about me? Listen, this is a huge key in getting rid of the fear. So let me just remind you of some things about God's love for you. How he views you. The first is this, I'm completely accepted or completed accepted, however you'd want to say it. I'm completely accepted here. It's important because our deepest wounds in life are those that are often caused by rejection. Somebody rejected me. Somebody didn't accept me. We want to be accepted. So here's the good news. You don't have to be accepted by everybody. You don't need everybody's approval. When we realize this issue of acceptance has already been settled by God. Your your acceptance has already been settled by God. Because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, Scripture says that you are acceptable to God in his sight. So we have to remember this, this love that God has for me, you're accepted. That issue has been settled a long time ago. You're accepted. The second thing is that you're unconditionally loved. There's a lot of things that you could say about God's love, but this is one of the strongest ones. It is unconditional. No strings attached on this. God doesn't say, I love you if. He doesn't say, I love you because. He says, I love you, period. And that's because God's love isn't based on what you do. It's based on who he is and what Jesus has already done. Listen, you got to remind yourself of these things if you want to walk out of here with confidence. Here's the third thing. I'm totally forgiven. There's no reason for you to carry shame because anything and everything that you have done, Jesus took care of. He took your sins to the cross. That issue is another one that has been resolved. You are absolutely 100% totally forgiven. Forgiven. And the last thing is, I'm extremely valuable. Value is determined by two things who owns it and what somebody's willing to pay for it. Scripture says that you are God's children, you belong to Him. And Scripture also tells us that He paid the highest price for you. He sent His Son, Jesus. 
if you will capture this and take it home, your confidence is going to skyrocket because you're going to be able to walk around with your head held high no matter what your circumstances are around you. Listen, you can't control that junk. You can't control that junk. But you know that this is rock solid, never changing. And you can lift your head high and you can walk. So understanding these things about God's love for you is extremely important in getting rid of fear. You are completely accepted, unconditionally loved, totally forgiven, and extremely valuable. So you could easily walk around and say, I've got the favor of God in my life. I've got the favor of God in my life. Now here's something, what we call, if you put all these together, you know what we call that. In church, we call that grace. We extend this unmerited favor. You've got the unmerited favor of God in your life. He loves you like crazy. All right, here's the third thing. Let's talk about this. It's our last one. Listen, this is where it plays out. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are you ready for this? We just talked about the way that God loves you. You haven't read it yet, have you? <laughs> Guys, listen, buckle up because this is where relationships change. I offer the same love to others. I struggle with this. I struggle with it. I do. I struggle with this. But this is where the rubber meets the road. The love that we just celebrated, the love that just kind of got us feeling really good inside, the love that we're just saying, man, that's powerful, that's strong, I'm confident, I'm lifting my head up, I got no shame, I got no guilt, I got no condemnation, that kind of love, we're supposed to extend that same grace in every relationship. In fact, here's what Jesus said about it. He said this, I'm giving you a new command, love each other just as I have loved you, right? So that, that verse kind of sounds flowery and, and fun and easy until you realize the context. This is tough stuff <laughs> to be able to extend the same love that Jesus extended to us, that we extend that to everyone. Listen, even, even the people you don't like, even the people that are hard to get along with, we're supposed to extend that same kind of love, that same grace to them. That gets tough, guys. Grace is something that we're so grateful to receive from God, but we're so hesitant to extend to others. But this is what transforms relationships. Are we able to take what God has extended to us and extend it to others? And so this, this, is what, this is what most relationships are lacking. And you probably know this. In your relationship with your kids, you know when there's been too much grace or not enough grace or wherever it's at. You know that, that there's that quotient, like something is missing right here. In your relationship with your spouse, in your relationship with your boss, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, whatever it is, it's usually a grace issue. We love receiving grace when we make mistakes, but we're hesitant in extending it to others oftentimes. Jesus said that you're to love everyone in the way that he has loved you, and that kind of love is going to drive the fear out of the relationships. Now, here's what I want to do today. As we wrap up, we need to remember that what we've talked about today has some context, and here's the context. God loves you like crazy. He gave absolutely everything to redeem you from your mistakes because we're not perfect. He meets you right where you're at. He loves you right there. He extends you grace. And he says, I have a better way if you want to come with me. That's the love that he, that's the context of all of this. Now, if you're here today and you've never said yes to that offer that God extended to you, guys, that's where it all begins, okay? All of the relationships that you have in this world are going to flow through your relationship with God. If you don't get that one right first, the rest of these are going to struggle because you haven't received the grace that Jesus is asking you to extend. You're empty. Have you ever felt empty before? 
You ever felt like you just didn't have it in you? You didn't have the grace to extend to other people? Let me tell you, there's one source where you go to get that. If you're ever feeling at a place in your life where you say, I just don't feel like I, I, I feel like I'm out of grace. I feel like I've spent it all. There's one place that you can go to to get filled back up, just to recenter yourself. And here's what I want to do. I just want to give you an opportunity today before we wrap up to say yes to that grace. Maybe you're in a place right now where you feel like you said yes to that grace and it's been a while ago and you're on E and you just need to get refilled. I'm going to tell you, it's the same source. You come back to him. You guys with me? I want to give you an opportunity just to say yes to that. So I'm going to ask you guys to bow your heads. This is something just between you and the Lord. If you're here today and you want to make Jesus the center of your life, you want that really strong, powerful love that we talked about, all the confidence, you want to get rid of the shame, you want to get rid of the guilt, you don't want to carry the fears and all that junk, you don't want that. You want the strong love of God. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to him right now. So you can pray a prayer with me right now. It's this simple. It's not magic words. It's you trying to express your heart to him. That's what matters. So pray this prayer with me. You could say, Jesus, right now, I accept your complete, your unconditional, your relentless, your powerful love in my life. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for, for dying on the cross to make up for all of my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. I'll be the first to say I've made mistakes. Thank you for taking those. And I give myself to you. And now I ask you to be the center of my life. Take the lead from this day forward. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer today, it's the most important reason that you came. All the relationships with everyone else are secondary to this one relationship with him. And I want to say thanks. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for making that decision. In fact, would you guys take a moment and congratulate those who prayed that prayer today? We're going to wrap up here with um, celebrating communion together. I'm going to ask our ushers if you guys would go ahead and come and start distributing um, these communion packs. In fact, would you toss me one? Hook me up. Yes. Hey, we uh, affectionately call these rip and sips. All right, these are portable communion packs. Um, here's, what I, here's what I love about this. It, it actually isn't about what you're holding in your hand. It's all about what Jesus said we're supposed to do when we do this. And he said, remember, remember what I've done. Remember the price that was paid. And so I'm gonna ask if you guys would all grab one of these elements here and uh, hold on to them. We're gonna receive them together, but you could go ahead and peel back that first layer if you can get it. Take out the bread, the little wafer that's in there. So this relationship that we get to celebrate with God was made possible because of what we're talking about today. Right? This, this is, again, like the context behind it all. It's this right here, what we're holding in our hands. And so let's take just a couple of minutes to talk about this. Jesus sat down on the night that he was betrayed, the night that he was uh, to, ready to pay the ultimate price for us so that this relationship with God could happen. On that night, he sat down with his closest disciples, and he took some bread, and they're sitting at a table, and he passes the bread around the room, and he said, take this bread, break off a piece of it, pass this around. This bread symbolizes my body. Now, guys, think about this. They had no idea what that meant. Because what Jesus was about to do, we're able to look back on now, today. But they didn't know what lay in front of them for those next 24 hours. So Jesus, all the symbolism that we're talking about here is absolutely powerful. Jesus gave his body for us. Broken, beaten, abused, absolutely abandoned so that you wouldn't have to go through those things by yourself. He paid the price for you and he said, take this bread. And every time that you do, remember the price that I paid 
for you. And so I'm going to invite you guys to take the bread as we remember the price that Jesus paid for us and receive it. Thank you, Lord. Scripture goes on to say in the same manner, he took a cup then and he passed it around. And he continues to talk. There's great symbolism still going on here. And he said, now this is a cup of my blood. It's it's a cup of a new covenant. In other words, I'm changing the rules. Because up to this point, your relationship with God was all dependent upon your perfection. But I have lived a perfect life in your place. And now your relationship with God is made possible not because of your perfection, but it's also, listen to me, your relationship with God is not prevented because of your imperfection. Now it's all about the price that I'm paying for you. And the price that I'm paying for you is the ultimate sacrifice. I'm spilling my blood for you. I'm giving my life. I lived a perfect life for you. And I'm going to die a death in your place so that you can have a relationship with God. He said, that's the new covenant. Today we call that a covenant of grace. Now we ought to be really excited that it's no longer a covenant of perfection, it's a covenant of grace. It opened the door for every one of us. And so when we take communion, Jesus said, remember the price that I paid so you could have that relationship. And this is the cup that's in front of us now. I invite you guys to drink it with me today. you guys stand with me we're going to sing a final song and I'd like to just pray one more time as we close let's pray together Lord we're extremely thankful there's honestly no way no words that we could find to be able to say thank you enough to to describe the gratitude that we have. The fact that you found us stuck in our sin. We we were absolutely stuck in our imperfection. There was no way back to you. And you saw us there. And you said, I'll pay whatever price it takes to have a relationship with them again. God, we can't even describe how grateful we are. When we were helpless, you came down and you helped us. When we were stuck, you set us free. And Jesus, we're so grateful that you were willing to pay the ultimate price. You gave it all so that we could have a life with the Father again. And so we want to celebrate you in this moment as we celebrate communion and we remember all the things that you did to make this life possible for us, God. It's not about us. It's not about what we've done. And it's not about what we do, God. But we want to commit everything that we are, all that we are, all that we have, we want to commit it to you now. And we thank you that you are the Lord of our relationships, all of them. And we ask that we would be able to do what you've asked us to do, God, that we would be able to extend the same grace, the same love that you've shown us. We'd be able to offer it to everyone that we come into contact with. We pray in your name. Amen.